of Marines who are normally uh, based in Okinawa. They were doing some training up at Camp Fuji and are now transiting back to Okinawa, but stopping here tonight to hear the president as he kicks off his 11-day, five-nation tour of Asia. This is the longest tour of Asia for an American president since George H.W. Bush about 25 years ago. The president will be here in Japan for the next couple of days, then he goes to South Korea, then a couple of days in Vietnam, going to Da Nang and Hanoi. China, and then finishing it off in Manila in the Philippines. You were mentioning, along with Jason Chaffetz, the threat that this entire region faces from North Korea, and in fact, a couple of intercontinental ballistic missiles have flown, or maybe medium-range missiles, have flown over the northern Japanese island of Hokkaido. So it's an issue of great sensitivity here in Japan as well. In addition to talking about security, the president will also be talking with Shinzo Abe today and again tomorrow about trade. The president is not happy with the fact that he, the United States has got trade deficits with all five nations that he's visiting. But this afternoon, Judge, they're going to take a little time off. You know how the president loves to golf. Shinzo Abe loves to golf. They're going to get together with Hideki Matsuyama. He is ranked number four in the world in professional golf to play around this afternoon. So the president kicking off this Asia trip with you know, one of the things he likes doing best, talking to the troops and then hitting a the little golf ball around for 18 holes, Judge. Uh, all right. You know what, John? Stay with us for just a little bit. The president is landing. We want to uh, uh, take you live to the president's remarks as soon as they begin. Uh, but, John, let, let's continue to watch this as the president lands. And, you know, it's interesting, John, that you say that the president is going to hit some golf balls or play a little golf. He seems to do a lot of business on the golf course. Well, what's really interesting is remember how he used to hammer President Obama for golfing instead of doing the nation's business? Well, the president plays golf probably as much as Barack Obama did. He's out there just about every weekend, whether it's in Virginia, whether it's in Bedminster or down at Mar-a-Lago playing one of the two Trump courses, the International at West Palm Beach or Trump National at Jupiter. He plays an awful lot of golf. But what the president likes to do is do business on the golf course. So in a way, even though he's playing golf, Judge, he's still working. Well, you know what? Uh, and, and I think therein lies the rub, that the president is always working. When when he's playing golf, he's working. And that's how he does business. And a lot of people do that. It's not just for the fun of it. It is a it is an amicable well, you know, setting within which to discuss world issues. I, I think there are a lot of people who probably do more business deals on the golf course than they do in the boardroom. I, I happen to not be one of them. All of my golf is purely recreational. <laughs> It should never be confused with anything coming close to business. But the president, remember, he had Lindsey Graham out. He had Rand Paul and Lindsey Graham out. He likes to do, you know, a lot of congressional business as well with people who appreciate being out there on the golf course. You, you get know, out there, you knock the ball around, you get the smell of grass and all that. And sometimes, you, 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 you know, the camaraderie builds and sometimes you see eye to eye uh, more uh, over a, a putt than you do over a boardroom table. Well, there's no question. I've been on those golf courses and the smell of fresh cut grass is almost intoxicating and certainly quite calming, especially if you're kind of stressed out as, as I often was, but I gave up the game because I wasn't too good at it. Anyway, uh, uh, John, we're going to come back to you uh, and as we watch the president and first lady landing in Japan just seconds ago, uh, we are awaiting the president's remarks to our troops at Yokota Air Base there. We'll take them live as soon as he begins, but first First, joining me now with his thoughts on what to expect from this very consequential president's trip to Asia, former United States ambassador to the U.N. and our Fox News contributor, John Bolton. All right. Good evening, uh, Ambassador. What is the significance of this visit and what is on the line for the United States? Well, it's a, an important visit. It comes at a critical time. I think uh, security in Asia uh, is at the top of the list. Uh, trade is certainly there as well. But the first three stops, uh, Japan, South Korea, and China, are going to be dominated by uh, the North Korean nuclear weapons program and what we're going to do about it. And that's why the president stopping in Japan first to underline the uh, alliance. Uh, you know, Shinzo Abe, the Japanese prime minister, perhaps the most pro-American Japanese prime minister since World War II. He really feels deeply about our country. Uh, and he began 
began his political rise as a member of the Japanese parliament by championing the families of Japanese citizens who were kidnapped by North Korea. Kidnapped, taken there, most of them have never been heard from again. So Abe is deeply knowledgeable about the, the threat North Korea poses. He stood side by side with President Trump at the United Nations back in September. I think he'll be uh, very much in favor of a strong stand on this as the president goes to China. So this is a, an important first stop here to, for these two allies to coordinate the, their next steps. And what do you expect? I mean, do you expect the president to modulate uh, his verbiage at all? I mean, you know Kim Jong-un is listening and the president is in kind of his part of the world. Uh, is Kim Jong-un going to do anything uh, just to be showy or to make a statement? Well, there's a lot of speculation we could see another missile launch. There's even speculation there might be a seventh nuclear test. I think it would be very poorly advised on Kim Jong-un's part, not that that would slow him down in the slightest. But uh, if he did, it would simply underline why the president, in my view, was right in September at the U.N. when he said denuclearization is the only way forward for North Korea. We're not going to accept that these people have deliverable nuclear weapons. And that's that's the message he'll certainly carry to South. South Korea, uh, but most importantly, when he arrives in Beijing and meets with uh, Xi Jinping, the Chinese leader. And and what do you expect to happen with Xi Jinping in China? I mean, it's kind of been a you know uh, a stop and go with him. Well, you know, for 25 years, the Chinese have been saying they don't want North Korea to have nuclear weapons. And uh, a lot of people in the United States nod and say, oh, the Chinese are with us. But they never do what they have uh, the capability of doing, which is really bringing North Korea's economy to its knees uh, and making sure that the weapons program stops. Now, Xi Jinping is at a, the high point of his uh, political power in China. Uh, I think he can call the shots on North Korea. And I think the president's prepared to put it to him very straight. Either this time uh, you take care of the North Korean nuclear weapons program. Let's do this uh, together the easy way. Uh, or we will not leave that regime in power with nuclear weapons and we'll do it the hard way. All right. You know, uh, Ambassador Bolton, I want you to stay with us. I know that uh, former Congressman Jason Chaffetz is still with us. Congressman, are, are you? Yes, you are still with us. All right, Congressman. I mean, in listening to uh, Ambassador Bolton as it relates to uh, Xi Jinping and whether or not, uh, you know, whether the visit to uh, China is going to impact anything since his visit to Mar-a-Lago many months ago. Oh, I hope it does. Look, we have three carrier groups uh, in the area. Uh, the Chinese do not want to have a mass exodus of people out of North Korea moving into China. They're in a position to have more influence on North Korean leader than probably anybody, as the ambassador knows. Um, and so we've got quite a show of force that's there and to have the president on the ground is going to be impactful, especially to all the servicemen and women that you see in those shots. Uh, they, they're away from their families in a very difficult situation to have the president there and say, hey, letting him know that uh, the president's got their back is a very strong message. And, you know, now that, you know, we see him coming into uh, uh, Tokyo now, what do you expect from the president in terms of his discussion with uh, uh, Abe as well as the troops? Well, look, uh, the troops is uh, making sure that they know they've got his back, but also the Prime Minister Abe and, and President Trump have a very good, strong uh, relationship. I mean, they they have uh, a regular communication. They've had good interaction. Uh, they're great partners of the uh, of the United States. Uh, when we had a congressional delegation there earlier this year, you had people from both sides of the aisle showing our, our strength and our relationship, and that's that's very good for the Japanese to to see that we're united in our support of Japan. Are the Japanese afraid of North Korea, Jason? Oh, absolutely. I mean, when we sat with uh, the prime minister, albeit a number of months ago, it was right at the top of their list. Uh, there were a group of businessmen that were here that I uh, spoke to last week, and they also had a deep, deep concern about the wild nature of the of the North, Car uh, uh, North Korean leader. And uh, 
There's a reason why we have three carrier groups, almost unprecedented, in the mm -hmm. area, in the region, to make sure that we could take care of any trouble that might flare up. All right, Congressman, stay with us. I'm going back to uh, the Ambassador Bolton. You know, uh, Ambassador, when you hear Congressman Chaffetz talk about, you know, the businessmen who are concerned about, you know, the business in Japan vis-a-vis uh, -vis the dangers of North Korea, I mean, how does um, uh, the, the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership and the business arrangement between the countries impact what is going on in terms of this visit? Well, trade issues are uh, unquestionably going to be on the agenda in all the countries that the president uh, visits. And despite our close political military relationship with Japan, we've had uh, our fair share of trade disputes with them over the years. But there's nothing like North Korean uh, nuclear weapons to concentrate the attention on what's really important. So I, I think they will try and make progress on the trade side, and I think they're likely to do it. You know, Abe is poised to uh, try and amend the Japanese post-World War II constitution, which we basically imposed on them, that gives up force uh, in, in the national defense. And the Japanese view themselves, their economy, as a, they're a normal nation now. They want to defend themselves. It's a very strongly held uh, position. You know, Abe's Ambassador, got the majority. You, you know, I have to interrupt you. I'm so sorry. What do you mean gives up force in the national defense? Explain that. Well, under their constitution, uh, they've got a very limited... Uh, at least uh, theoretically capability. They call it the Japanese Self-Defense Forces. Now, these forces are very, very capable, but uh, Abe wants to change the way that Japan thinks about its place in Asia to, to move beyond World War II. They, they like to say they consider themselves a normal country now, and a normal mm -hmm. country should provide for its own uh, self-defense. I think this would be an amazing step forward and a big plus for the United States. And uh, as you can see, it looks like uh, the staircase is uh, coming down, and hopefully we will see uh, the president actually not coming down. They're moving the staircase to Air Force One as the president lands in Tokyo with the first lady about to uh, make remarks to the troops at the Yokota Air Base. Uh, and so, Ambassador Bolton, as, as we keep talking, you know, several months back, uh, South Korea was very resistant to the missile defense system, almost dissing the, the concept that they needed protection from North Korea. Do you think that that's changing and that it will change as the president continues in this very consequential sequential visit to the uh, to the Far East? Well, it has changed somewhat, but the, the president, Moon Jae-in, is uh, an inheritor of what was called uh, 10 or 15 years ago the sunshine policy uh, toward North Korea, that, gee, only if we could only open more ties with them, everything would be fine and we wouldn't have this tension on the peninsula. I think it's a very badly misguided policy. So this will be a difficult conversation for our president uh, because he's got to worry about Americans threatened by North Korea nuclear weapons. Now, let me say, South Korea is politically is very divided, and uh, there's a lot of support for the president's strong stand on North Korea. The leader of the South Korean opposition just about 10 days ago called for the redeployment of American tactical nuclear weapons in South Korea, which is quite an amazing thing to happen there. So this will be a difficult relationship, uh, but the president, I think, really needs to move the South Korean president along because uh, they're getting to the point in North Korea where they will be able to hit uh, a target in the United States, anywhere in the continental United States with nuclear weapons. Uh, it, perhaps in a matter of months. That's what CIA Director Mike Pompeo said within right. the past few weeks. Right, right. And, and stay with us, Ambassador. Congressman Chaffetz, any, any input uh, on this whole issue of the redeployment of the nuclear weapons uh, in, uh, uh, you know, as it relates to South Korea and their previous somewhat resistance to our assistance? Well, just uh, prior to the election of President Moon, the FAD system was being deployed, and, and, and President Moon, uh, you know, had a bit more of a dovish type of approach. But as you've seen since his election, he's actually taken a bit of a tougher stance. Okay, I'm going uh, to interrupt. But I think when he's uh, able to sit face to face, just, hold on, Congressman. Uh, you can see on the screen uh, the president and the first lady uh, uh, coming down the uh, stairway there uh, as they arrive in Japan at the uh, air base uh, in Tokyo. Uh, being greeted, of course, by the dignitaries there on the tarmac. Uh, 
And uh, all right, Congressman, keep going. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Since President Moon has been in place, they've taken an actually a little bit tougher stance, uh, uh, you know, uh, on the aggression that you've seen out of North Korea. Uh, but the deployment of the THAAD system uh, is a very important system, and we need more of it. It takes time to get it all fully in place. They want more of it, but then you've also got to look at what's going on in Guam. But to see the president on the ground in Japan, this is a good moment. Well, it certainly is. And, uh, you know, I think it's kind of, uh, to both of you, Ambassador Bolton, as well as the congressman, it's kind of an in-your-face to Kim Jong-un, which is so much the way our president uh, handles that situation with that lunatic out there. But, uh, Ambassador Bolton, I am just hearing uh, from my producer in my ear that the president has just confirmed Firm to reporters on Air Force One that he is expecting uh, to meet with uh, Putin. Uh, have you heard that yourself, Ambassador? Well, it had been speculated about, and you know, one of the things that happens at these multilateral meetings, this would be in uh, Da Nang or, or in the Philippines, uh, is that it's not just the big meetings where things get done, it's in the bilateral meetings as they say, on the margins of the, of the bigger meetings. And I think it's appropriate for him to meet with Putin when they're uh, in this kind of forum. There's obviously a lot to talk about uh, and a lot of things to push back on Putin on. So it's, uh, it's not surprising, really. Uh, all right. Uh, Ambassador Bolton, Congressman Chaffetz, stay with us. We're going to go to uh, John Roberts, who I understand may have some information on that very uh, topic. John? Yeah, hey, Judge, uh, the president came back for about 11 minutes on Air Force One, back to the press cabin on the way from Honolulu here to uh, Yokota Air Base. He did say that it looks like he's going to meet with uh, Vladimir Putin in Da Nang on the sidelines of the APEC conference. You'll remember the last time they got together was on the sidelines of the G20 conference in Hamburg. So it's probably expected that the two of them would uh, would meet. The president says it's very important to get Russia's cooperation on North Korea. So that's one of the reasons why they're going to meet at the APEC conference in Da Nang, and that will be uh, the first part of next week, or well, actually middle part of next week. Uh, on North Korea, the president said that he will make a decision soon, quote, soon, on whether or not to designate North Korea a state sponsor of terrorism. Uh, that announcement uh, may come uh, further on in the trip. Uh, also disputes that uh, President Xi Jinping comes to his meeting with a new sense of power after uh, claiming uh, victory in the uh, Chinese elections, and, and many people believe that he is got more power than any other Chinese leader since Mao Zedong. And uh, one other point, the president said that, uh, that he tweeted the other day that he would like, uh, maybe it might have been this morning, I don't know, we were on a plane for 24 hours, Judge, that he would like that the initial public offering for Aramco, the Saudi national oil uh, company, to be on the... Uh, New York Stock Exchange. The president says that he talked to King Salman today, and uh, the king is uh, mulling over a decision whether or not to do it on the New York Stock Exchange. The president said it's very important because we want to have all the big listings. He knows that they're looking at London and others. Uh, so the president would definitely like to see that come to the New York Stock Exchange, and he put in that bid with King Salman. Hey, one interesting little piece of color, and you can hear that the Air Force rock and roll band is really uh, kicking it up uh, here tonight. As Air Force One was coming in, the Air Force Orchestra, who's on a riser just opposite the band, was playing the Jerry Goldsmith theme from uh, the movie Air Force One, the Harrison Ford film. We saw that all the time during the election campaign uh, when, when the president would roll up in his aircraft, sort of setting the stage, if you will, for you becoming president. You know what, president. John, I have to tell you, yeah, the, the president loves music. He really does. And he always is like keying does, the music into the event. You know, it's very Donald Trump, very yeah, President it, it, Trump now. And again, we have seen it in these campaign style events, whether it was the Trump plane or whether it was Air Force One, when he was making uh, you know, some of his first stops after becoming president. But it's the very first time I have ever heard an Air Force band play that theme when uh, Air Force Run rolls up. So something a little unique here in Yakota tonight, John. Well, you know what, and, and it is exciting. The president, of course, is uh, going to be walking into that hangar to speak to the troops. And of course, uh, you know, to our viewers, stay with us. We're going to be with you uh, throughout all of it. But you know, John, when you think about it, I mean, our troops go through so much, a little music, a little fun, a little rock and roll. That's the least that we can give to them. 
Well, you know, when we pulled up here to the uh, the hangar uh, in our bus coming from the other side of the airport where our press charter landed, I could hear music. They were playing Hotel California. I thought to myself, you know, that sounds like that sounds like live music. I don't think that's recorded music. And you know, the military always does it up big. They have these these choirs, they have the orchestras, they have these bands, and it's always great to see the men and women of our armed forces coming out here and doing it live. Because really, Judge, that's the only way it should be done at these events. And, and you know what, John? I don't know what's happened to it, but there was talk uh, about a military parade uh, have you in Washington. Have you heard anything about that? This, this is something that fell out of the invitation that President Macron of France gave to the president last summer. We were there for Bastille Day, where every Bastille Day, which is celebrating French Independence Day is their version of our 4th of July. Right, they right. have a huge military parade down the Champs Elysees, and it was very impressive. And the president was the guest of honor right there at the Place de la Concorde, watching all the tanks and all of the troops marching down. And he was so impressed by that, he said that he would like to have something similar down Pennsylvania Avenue in downtown Washington. Now, typically, you know, there's been a separation between the military and public celebrations for the 4th. Of July, you know, in all the towns and cities across the country, it's always the fire department, and the police, and the you know the, the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts and all right. those local organizations <laughs> that come out for those parades. So I don't know Washington D.C., but the president said that's something he would like to see. Well, I got to tell you, John, I think it would be a shot in the arm for our military, you know, for all those men and women who've given up so much for us to be recognized on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. And if you're just joining us, you can see the president there on the screen live in Tokyo, just arriving at uh, at the Air Force Base in Tokyo, about to walk into the hangar to speak with the troops. Uh, the music from live band uh, maybe maybe striking up again, maybe not. But the president, along with the first lady, on his his way in to address our troops in a hangar uh, at the uh, Tokyo Air Force Base. And uh, John, do you know how far he is from going in there? Uh, I don't judge, and apologies because we lost the light that uh that was taking care of my lighting up front here. But, you know, better to watch the president than watch me. Anyways, uh, he's greeting some dignitaries out there. Then he goes behind the scenes uh, for a little while and just takes a breather yeah, and goes over the like, script once you know or what, twice John, and, and gets like, ready to come out. It looks like he's actually signing autographs. He's, he's, being, he's being President Donald Trump. He's taking selfies. He's signing autographs. You know, he is a, he's a very engaging individual. He's very accommodating. He's not, you know one of those stiff ones who walk through arrogantly. He'll accommodate people. He'll accede to their requests. Anyway, John, until he gets in there, I want to go to Ambassador Bolton and uh, back to my uh, Congressman Chaffetz. Uh, Ambassador uh, uh, Bolton uh, on his way in to talk to the troops. We were talking about the possibility of a military parade, something that apparently came up when the president was in France uh, with Macron uh, several months ago. What do you think of that ambassador? Well, I think it'd be a great idea. I think we've had some uh, great uh, celebrations uh, of the military. I remember the uh, victory parade after uh, the first Persian Gulf War when uh, General Schwarzkopf led uh, units of all the services that participated uh, down. President George H.W. Bush was there. It was a great event, a great celebration, great tribute to the military. Uh, I think it would be very appropriate. It'd be great. Yeah, and uh, it would be. And right now, what we're uh, what we're waiting for is the president as he walks his way into that uh, hangar in Tokyo to talk to the troops. Um, if you uh, are just joining us, uh, this is Justice with Judge Janine. And uh, in a few seconds, like right about now, it is 10 p.m. Uh, on uh, the East Coast uh, and yeah, 11 a.m. in Tokyo around that. And uh, stay with us as we await the president addressing our troops in Tokyo in the Air Force Base where he has just landed. And uh, Ambassador Bolton is still with us.
us, along with Congressman Chaffetz, John Roberts, of course, uh, right there in Tokyo with the president. Uh, Congressman Chaffetz, have you ever accompanied the president, uh, whether it was President Bush or anyone else, on one of these trips? No, I, no, I haven't. I've gone with congressional delegations, but uh, you know, I was elected the same time as uh, President Obama, so I well, didn't did. exactly get an invitation to join Air Force One on that one. So uh, I was just going to that. You know, I purposely left him out, but you know, I I thought, well, you know, who knows? Who knows? And uh, Ambassador Bolton, I mean, you've been in the nope. thick of these meetings. <laughs> Well, it's, uh, it's impressive uh, to watch the president travel. It's quite an operation, and uh, a lot of work goes into it, and, uh, and uh, the, the, just the logistics and the technical aspects are, are really uh, kind of overwhelming. But it's, it's very impressive, and it's designed to convey uh, that our president is the leader of the greatest nation in the world. So it's worth the effort, I think. And, and, and you know what, Ambassador? It is an incredible show of force and power. You know, we saw some still photographs today of uh, the beast, uh, the vehicle that I believe carried uh, as well as uh, uh, the first lady uh, when they go into other countries. Very, very impressive, uh, uh, you know, vehicle display along with, of course, the military display as well as the, uh, uh, the powerful number of military forces that accompany him. Uh, again, if you're just joining us, this is Justice with Judge Janine. It is a little after 10 p.m. on the East Coast, 11 a.m. in Tokyo. The president about to address our, to our troops in Tokyo, uh, where he has just landed with the First Lady, uh, where it is Sunday morning at 11 a.m. All right, and uh, we're right there at Dakota Air Base. He should be walking in any minute. Big flag there. Kind of reminds me of my flag behind the set at Justice. No? <laughs> uh, and, you know, we heard live music. Uh, John, are you with us? Is John Roberts still with us? Yeah, there's that yeah, live music. Here. Go ahead, Judge. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just curious as to whether or not you could see whether the president has walked in and how long before he gets to the stage. Uh, well, I can tell by the movements out there on the tarmac that he's finished uh, doing uh, the selfies and the autographs and things like that. He's probably in the holding room in the back here in the hangar. Uh, again, just probably going over his notes. It's been a long trip for him coming all the way from Hawaii and then Washington to Hawaii yesterday and then the day's events there. He got to be quite late last night. So he'll just take a couple of minutes, get a breather, drink the water, go over his notes, and then he'll be out here because there are a lot of people who are waiting to see the president. It, it's really interesting to me, Judge, having been through the entire campaign and then followed him for the last almost 10 months now as president, that the one group that he really has an affinity for, and you can really tell that it's, it's return, is with the military. Yeah, there's and no And that's question. why he was out there signing autographs and, yeah, taking selfies with people. That the group of people that he appreciates so much is that 1% that gives so much to the defense of this country. And we, we heard John Kelly speak so eloquently about that, the chief of staff, the former commander general, uh, who I first got to know in Iraq back in 2003 during the invasion, talking about the fact that the majority of people in this country do not know what it's like to serve in the military. Yeah. And he was taking questions that day from members of the press in the Brady briefing room. And he said, how many people here are from a Gold Star family? Nobody put up their hand. Yeah. And he said, how many people know a Gold Star family? And it was, it was only a handful of individuals who did. So it, it re really shows the rarefied environment in which these men and women, these brave men and women, these courageous men and women from our military and the families that support them serve it. It's really, it's only 1% one, only 1 of the population, Judge, but it's a 1% that gives so much to this country. And, and you know, um, I'm going to bring Ambassador Bolton back. You know, uh, Ambassador John Roberts is so correct. I mean, President Trump has such an affinity and such an, a, a, a display of affection for not only the military, but for law enforcement. And you 
you can see that it's real and it's genuine and it's the kind of thing that Americans are almost unaccustomed to, especially in the last eight years. And so, you know, his display of respect for them, I think, is causing the whole country to uh, to take another look at the military, especially where there are so few of us who are in military families, unlike other countries like Israel, for example, where everybody, men and women, are part of the uh, Israeli Defense Force. Yeah, well, there's a strong argument that uh, really the military draft was something that uh, helped bring the country together, that yeah. uh, it, it, put, uh, it put a responsibility on everybody. And while philosophically an all-volunteer army makes a lot of sense, you have to wonder if uh, that common uh, effort in the military uh, for a year or two years uh, isn't something that we should take a look at again as we see all these fractures and political splits in the country. Uh, I think it has a lot to recommend it. Well, and, and Congressman Chaffetz also, in terms of the military and the president, uh, his, his show of respect for them and the possibility of even a military parade. And what we're seeing here tonight, uh, do you expect that there might be a difference in terms of this country and given someone like General Kelly being chief of staff and Mattis and, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the respect for the military in this administration? Administration. No, absolutely. And it comes on the heels of a, a very disappointing ruling on, on Bo Bergdahl. And, oh. and, and I think a, a lot of families, military families, were absolutely devastated. It'll be interesting to see if the president addresses that and talks about it. But I also, I, I want to remind people, there are literally tens of thousands of Americans who are affected by this trip. When you have three carrier groups in the area, we have a very difficult time operating without the help and assistance of the Japanese. We're going into those ports. Uh, our men and women uh, and their families are, are ingrained in the, to the Japanese culture. Uh, and so to have the president there uh, is just an added special uh, benefit uh, and a bonus. And I think you'll see the Japanese people really embrace this president because he is very, uh, very much pro-military. But his relationship with Prime Minister Abe comes at a very critical time. And they do have a very good working relationship. And that spills over to the military as well. And, you know, when you say that, uh, Congressman, it's, it spills over to ordinary Americans and the importance yeah. of allies and friendship. All right. I'm hearing in my ear that the president is about to come to the podium. We don't quite know Gentlemen, who's uh, here. He comes. First lady of the United States. Take the lesson. <laughs> Okay, everybody. Mr. President, sir, I will tell you that you look great in that suit, but there's something missing. Could I please ask the wing commander of the biggest, baddest, meanest C-130 wing in the Air Force, Colonel Bull Moss, to come out here? Go ahead, Bull. Just give, no, just give the boss. Oh, wow. Should I put it on? I like this better. You can have my jacket, just... Thank you, thank you, honey, thank you. Oh boy, that's something. This is a great group of people. Thank you very much, and General Martinez, everybody, for your devoted leadership. 
of our brave troops right here in Japan. And especially, thank you, especially, especially to all of the incredible service members. We're really here today, and we're going to have a good time. And we're going to celebrate your achievements. So I'll issue one of your favorite commands. Are you ready? At ease. At ease. Just sit there. Now have a good time. Just have a good time. Milani and I also want to extend a special thanks to Ambassador Bill Haggerty, who's doing an outstanding job. He's an outstanding person. I know him very well. Believe me, you got one of the great ones. He's leading our American embassy in Tokyo. I'm honored to be here today in this beautiful country, home of the extraordinary people of Japan. Japan is a treasured partner and crucial ally of the United States. And today we thank them for welcoming us and for decades of wonderful friendship between our two nations. Americans have deep respect and admiration for the people of Japan, their amazing culture, their strong spirit, and their very proud history. So on behalf of the United States of America, I send the warmest wishes of the American people to the citizens of this remarkable country. Mm. Now I know how you guys feel. This is pretty good. <laughs> Our travels across Asia will take us to many historic places, to see many wonderful sights, and to speak before many audiences. But there is no single place I'd rather begin my trip than right here with all of you, the incredible men and women of the United States military and your amazing partners, the Japanese Self-Defense Forces. Thank you for being here. Thank you. To everyone here today who serves your country, uniform, thank you, thank you, thank you. We salute you. <laughs> What's your rank? <laughs> We're going to raise it. We salute you, we honor you, and we stand proudly with the men and women who defend us and our way of life. Nations are built from the courage, love, and sacrifice of patriots just like you. Each of you inherits the proud legacy of generations of warriors that have walked these very grounds for more than seven decades. From Yokota's runways, American pilots took to the air and drove back the invaders during the Korean War. Tremendous courage, tremendous bravery. From here, they enforced a precious peace during a long and bitter Cold War. And in the aftermath of the devastating 2011 tsunami, this base served as the launching point for Operation Tomodachi largest humanitarian relief effort in American history, which saved the lives of thousands and thousands of great Japanese citizens. Like those who came before you, you always rise to the occasion, and you never, ever let your country down. General Martinez, General Shirati, General Pascarette, Rear Admiral Fenton, Brigadier General Winkler, Colonel Moss, and Chief Master Sergeant Green, you lead the forces under your command with exceptional skill and devotion, and America is tremendously grateful to you. We're also very fortunate to stand alongside such strong and capable allies. General Mahira, 
General Asai, General Imaki, and General Ando. Thank you for your leadership and service. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. On behalf of the American people, I want each and every one of you, both American and Japanese, to know that your service and commitment helps keep us all safe, strong, and free. I also want to express our gratitude to the family members and loved ones who sacrificed so much to make your service possible. They are absolutely incredible people, and it's not easy. America is profoundly grateful for all you do. And we are back home starting to do, I will tell you, and you're reading and you're seeing really, really well. The stock market is at an all time high. <laughs> Unemployment back in the United States is at a 17 year low. Almost 2 million jobs have been added since a very, very special day. It's called Election Day, November 8th. 2 million jobs. Oh. It's a lot of jobs. And we've dealt ISIS one brutal defeat after another, and it's about time. It's truly inspiring to see American airmen and Marines and Japanese. Yeah. yeah, I have a great Marine here, General Kelly, four star. Did anyone ever hear of General Kelly? Where's General Kelly? He is something. Now he's chief of staff, but he does like those four stars. I want to tell you that. But American airmen and the Marines and Japanese self-defense forces, they're standing here with us today, side by side, confident, committed, and more capable than ever. You instill confidence in the hearts of our allies, and you strike fear in the hearts of our enemies. It's the way it should be, isn't it? <laughs> our alliance is a testament to the transformative power of freedom. Today, nations that once waged war now stand together as friends and partners in pursuit of a much better world. And we're getting there. We're getting there faster than you think. With your presence here today, shoulder to shoulder, you put hope into every soul that yearns for peace. All of you have made Yakota one of the most capable operational bases in Japan and actually anywhere in the world. For over a decade, this incredible place has been home not only to American service members, but also to the Air Defense Command of the Japanese Air Self-Defense Force. Today, this base serves as a critical center for coordination for American and Japanese commanders to plan their missions. For almost 60 years, the military alliance we see on this base has endured a cornerstone of sovereignty, security, and prosperity for our nations, this region, and indeed, the entire world. Today, we pay tribute to that legacy, a legacy you protect and grow each and every day. We dominate the sky, we dominate the sea, we dominate the land and space. Not merely because we have the best equipment, which we do. And by the way, a lot of it's coming in. You saw that budget. That's a lot different than in the past. A lot of beautiful brand new equipment is coming in. And nobody makes it like they make it in the United States. Nobody. Got a lot of stuff coming. Use it well. But because we have more important than equipment, we have the best people. 
Each of you embodies the warrior creed. Your devotion, prowess, and expertise make you the most fearsome fighting force in the history of our world. Together with our allies, America's warriors are prepared to defend our nation using the full range of our unmatched capabilities. No one, no dictator, no regime, and no nation should underestimate ever American resolve. Every once in a while in the past, they underestimated us. It was not pleasant for them, was it? It was not pleasant. We will never yield, never waver, and never falter in defense of our people, our freedom, and our great American flag. That flag stands for the values of our republic, the history of our people, the sacrifice of our heroes, and our loyalty to the nation we love. As long as I am president, the service men and women who defend our nation will have the equipment, the resources, and the funding they need to secure our homeland, to respond to our enemies quickly and decisively, and when necessary, to fight, to overpower, and to always, always, always win. Right? This is the heritage of the American Armed Forces, the greatest force for peace and justice the world has ever known. Free nations must be strong nations, and we welcome it when our allies from Europe to Asia renew their commitment to peace through strength. We seek peace and stability for the nations of the world, including those right here in this region, and it's a great region. As Americans celebrate Veterans Day this month, we honor all who have sacrificed to make peace and stability possible. We pay tribute to every proud American who has worn the uniform and served our country. Today, many nations of the Indo-Pacific are thriving because of the sacrifices made by American service members and our allies, and because of the sacrifices all of you continue to make each and every day. Here in Japan, we have seen the amazing things that are possible. When a people are free and independent, over the course of a single lifetime, the Japanese people have built one of the most successful societies and nations in the world. Over the next 10 days, we travel to South Korea, China, Vietnam, and the Philippines. We will seek new opportunities for cooperation and commerce, and we will partner with friends and allies to pursue a free and open Indo-Pacific region. We will seek free, fair, and reciprocal trade. But this future is only within our grasp because of you. You make it possible for peace-loving nations to thrive and for peace-loving people to prosper. You are the reason the great American flag will proudly stand behind me wherever I go. And every time I look at that flag, I will think of brave men and women like you. And I will think of all of the American patriots down through the generations who poured out their blood, sweat, tears, hopes, and dreams to defend our country. When you follow your citizens and people across the Indo-Pacific region, See the flags of free and sovereign states, like the United States and Japan, displayed during our diplomatic meetings over the next 10 days. Be proud of your nation, be proud of your service, and be proud of the security you provide that makes it all possible. 
like your predecessors, you, our brave warriors, are the last bulwark against threats to the dreams of people in America and Japan and all across the world. You are the greatest hope for people who desire to live in freedom and harmony, and you are the greatest threat to tyrants and dictators who seek to prey on the innocent. History has proven over and over that the road of the tyrant is a steady march toward poverty, suffering, and servitude. But the path of strong nations and free people, certain of their values and confident in their futures, is a proven path toward prosperity and peace. We cherish our cultures, we embrace our values, and we always fight for what we believe in. Because of you, the people of America, the people of Japan, and the freedom-loving people everywhere are able to fulfill their destinies and follow their dreams. And we are grateful for your families, for their sacrifice and support that allows our brave men and women to serve. We also appreciate the sacrifice of dedicated civilians who keep this base going and take care of our military and their precious loved ones. We are eternally grateful for your service and for your sacrifice. And we are forever in your debt. I am so proud to be here with you today. We face many challenges and many opportunities. And we will face all of them together as a team. And if we do, I am certain that the future for America, for Japan, and for our cherished allies has never, ever looked brighter. Because of patriots like you, freedom will prevail. Thank you. God bless you. God bless the armed forces. And God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. All right, we see President Donald Trump completing his speech to the U.S. troops at the Yokota Air Force Base, uh, at the Yokota Air Force Base in Tokyo, Japan. A very inspirational speech. The president clearly with an affection for the military, giving them a big shot in the arm, uh, talking about what a treasured partner Japan is to the United States, now a crucial ally. And even though at one point, we we were countries that were at war. We now stand together as friends and partners in pursuit of a much better world. It was clear that this audience, this military audience, was very jazzed up for the uh, president. And he had some very warm words to those troops, telling them that Americans salute them, that they honor them, and that because of them, American people have a remarkable country. And uh, in indicating to the troops as well that they have never let us down, but also taking a little credit for the event. For well, what's going on in the United States, the, the uh, stock market at an all-time high, unemployment at a 17-year low, 2 million jobs since he took, uh, since Election Day, and an ISIS being defeated, one uh, uh, defeat after another. He gave the military real kudos in saying that they strike fear in the hearts of our enemies. And not only does the United States have the best equipment, we have the best people. And that we dominate the sky, the sea, the land, and space. And that is President Trump giving kudos to the military at the Dakota Air Force Base, or Yokota Air Force Base in Tokyo, Japan. I'm going to call in uh, Ambassador Bolton now as we see the president saying goodbye. Uh, or right now I'm hearing Congressman Chaffetz. Uh, Congressman, you still with us? Yes, yes I am. All right, Congressman, what's your take on that speech this evening? Or 11 a.m.-ish in, in uh, Tokyo? 
Uh, look, the president makes us proud there. You know, it, these are tough, tumultuous and dangerous times. And you got tens of thousands of Americans out there serving our nation, uh, being that front line of defense. You got three uh, uh, carrier groups in the area. And, I, you know, you had a president who is fiercely patriotic. And I love it. And I think they loved it, too. No apologies. He knows that the, Ameri the United States of America is the, the strongest superpower in the world. Uh, and he makes no apologies for it. Uh, he loves the red, white, and blue. You can see it in his, in his face, the way he projects it. He's talking from his heart. And that oh, will yeah. radiate out to those tr troops. It, it was just absolutely, it was great. Yeah, and you know, it, it's so it's so powerful when he talks about them and he talks yeah. about, you know, American patriots. And, you know, I was kind of thrown back to the, you know, Winston Churchill when he said American patriots yeah. have poured out, uh, you know, their blood, their sweat, their tears, uh, you know, for the dreams of, of Americans. I mean, a very powerful speech, very well delivered, very well received, uh, a real uh, 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 hand of Friendship to Japan, uh, our ally, and and you know very refreshing, Congressman, that the United States and the President, you know, showing public displays of cooperation with allies, uh, as opposed to the last eight years when our allies had no idea they were our allies based on how they were being treated by Barack Obama. Yeah, no, look, uh, it harkens back to the times of Ronald Reagan, where uh, peace through strength is uh, one of the things that President Trump talked about that Ronald Reagan projected. And I think that gives comfort to our allies. They know that we are going to work in partnership with them. We, one of our greatest allies is the, the Japanese. Uh, and we're working closely with South Koreans as well. But everybody in that region is listening to where the president's coming for him. And he is not wavering at all about his commitment to protect the United States, to help protect the world, and make sure that we have the biggest know in order to get it done. Well, yeah, and that's what he said. You know, we dominate the sky, the sea, the land. And in space, yeah. uh, you could you could almost hear the uh, you know the hangar uh, uh, vibrating at that point. A and he said, you know, we must always win, uh, and, and that was very refreshing too. I mean, where the goal is to win, it was very much Reagan-like. Mm -hmm. You know, what's the goal? The goal is to win. Well, I think I think the biggest one of the biggest applause lines is the fact that we're now taking the fight to ISIS. I mean, that place erupted with applause. Yeah. These, these are people that want to engage in the fight. They yeah. want to protect America. They're, they're willing to roll up their sleeves and and take the risk in order to get out there and protect the United States. And now they finally have a president who's right there with them and has their back. That, yeah. That's what. You know, they're out there by themselves, away from their family and friends in a very tough, difficult thing. You know, the Kim Jong-un, who knows what he's going to do at any given time. But there you have a president who's willing to fight for their resources, fight for their families and fight for the United States. Clearly. And, uh, you know, uh, to our viewers right now, uh, President Trump just finishing uh, his speech to the troops at the uh, Yokota Air Force Base in Tokyo, Japan, where he landed. Uh, Approximately 30 minutes ago with the First Lady, uh, the President there taking back to the stage with First Lady Melania Trump. Uh, we're going to stay with this until the President actually gets on Marine One, uh, where uh, he's going to take off to uh, join Prime Minister Abe uh, to play a little golf to get out there on the links. But we have just heard a very powerful, very inspiring speech uh, to the members.